My name is Anthony Scott, and this is another episode of Making It North. Making It North is a show all about creating and making stuff here in the North, specifically in Maine. And my guest today is going to be none other than my mom, Shannon Scott, or as my kids like to call her, Mama Scott. But before we go to our guest and start talking about um, the, the topics and, and the kinds of things that she creates and the impact that she has on those around her. Um, well, we're going to play my little ditty that I've created for this and, and show off my, my logo. Um, and this is once more a, an appeal to anyone out there in YouTube land who has the expertise into putting these kinds of things together and can make this look a little bit more polished. Though I'm not real worried about great polish because this is supposed to be casual and accessible and fun for everyone anyway. But anyway, having said that, here we go. All right, all right, all right, all right. Um, hi, Mom. Hi. <laughs> it's really good of you to be here today and agree to do this. Um, I think, you know, I, I like to think of myself as a person who who dabbles in a lot of different creative things. Uh, and some things I like to try to do better and focus on more than others. But um, I really think that a lot of my sensibility of myself as a creative person yeah, I owe it really to you. Um, and it could be that you did just what every other mom does whenever a kid's little and just praised whatever kind of stuff I was scribbling down, even if it wasn't that great. And but I took it but I but I took it seriously and I, I thought I thought you were you were absolutely accurate when you said I was a genius. <laughs> so <laughs> so well, I just Anthony, go ahead. May I interrupt you just for a second? Sure. I wanted to grab one of those little pictures that you drew for me when you was about four or five years old and show it to everybody so they can see what your creativity was then. Okay. If you've got it handy, grab it. Pretty quick. Okay. Just a minute. Okay. While she is grabbing that, you'll see in the background there of her, um, where she is, she's actually got some of her creations that she actually has made recently and it has, even available for people who may, may want to purchase something there. But she's she's quite the creative person. I don't know if you can s tell anything about this or not. Hold it Is back it just a little small? bit. Hold it back okay. just a little bit closer to your face. Okay. Now, I see right now we see the top one. It looks like it's maybe it's supposed to be a It's a what? A horse. Yeah. And then we've got two people that look like a man and a woman talking or something. Do you see the teeth of the horse? Yeah, hold, go, slide it down just a little bit. Slide the whole thing down a little bit. Yeah. Okay. okay. And pull it back closer to your face again. Okay. It starts distorting. Yeah, okay. We're getting a sense of the teeth there. Yep. Yep. Now, the bottom picture, I think it was, I don't remember if it was Angela or your grandmother they were wondering, this guy in the picture, what he was looking at. <laughs> I couldn't tell you. I don't even remember drawing. I mean, they look, the horse looks familiar to me, um, but I don't remember anything beyond the fact that that horse looks familiar. I think well, I was, the horse I was inspired by is some art I saw in a book somewhere, I think. Well, this was just the beginning of your creativity, then around 11 or 12 years old uh you did a recording insults by dorchester that i still have that yes. uh yes. your kids have enjoyed listening to <laughs> but uh i don't know i think it's all part of making it fun uh, that's exactly what it is it's all about having fun and and just taking ideas from your head and making them real and just just having fun it's 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 um my another interview that I've done with an, someone else that's not up on YouTube yet, uh, John Simonoff, he pointed out that he had a director that really influenced him in his early musical career who would say that, remember, we call it playing music, not not working at music. It's all about play. And that's really what creativity is all about. It's just about playing and dabbling and experimenting and put things together and see what comes out, you know. Um, so having said that, um, 
I'm, I'm kind of whether I want to mention this now or after we've gotten a chance to see. I, I'm going to go ahead and just go in the order that my notes are. Uh, but when I talked to you about doing this, um, you said something. You said, huh, well, I, I never thought of myself as a creative person. And I was very surprised to hear that come out of your mouth. Um, and I would like you just just to kind of tell us why you never thought of yourself that way. What what did you think a creative person was and why did you think you weren't that? Uh, first of all, I always believed that a creative person was somebody that could come up with original ideas. And I never thought my ideas were original. I always felt like I was copying somebody else. But I was always able to take somebody else's idea and adapt it to my needs. So if you call that creativity, I, I guess maybe I was. And another thing is I always was trying to use what I had to make it work because I didn't feel like I had the accessibility to buy new. And in the long run, I have learned to appreciate more what I created and what I did more so than what I was able to go out and buy because it becomes a part of you. Uh, I just, uh, it bleeds over into what I do now. Uh, I never liked uh, to shop, uh, which is kind of unusual, uh, an unusual statement, I guess, for women to say anyway. Uh, it was boring. It made me tired. Uh, there was always a certain thing I was looking for that never seemed to be available. I never liked to try on clothes. Uh, and uh, in younger years, uh, your grandmother, your granny, uh, made all of my clothes for me. Uh, I attribute my whole wardrobe to her. She was very good. And then when she got older and was not doing that anymore, I thought, well, I can do that. And so um, what I know and what I do is self-taught uh, only because <laughs> I have the tenacity to stick it through. Uh, mm -hmm. In the beginning stages of anything, it's hard. And the more you pursue it, the easier it becomes. And uh, I do have a young lady that has been coming for instruction, sewing classes, uh, which I f get a great thrill out of that. I enjoy teaching. So I would not say my creativity in, is in what I do. My creativity is coming up with ideas uh, to teach somebody else, to make it easier for them, to make it fun. Uh, I feel like I did not have those opportunities when I was younger. So I always go back to that. If I want to help somebody else, how can I make them understand it? But uh, the creative <coughs> process in me is always trying to make something else work. Um, whether it be rearranging furniture, whether it be organizing a closet uh, or just accessories for the house to make it look nice. I like things to be in order. I like um, to be pleasing. I like people to like what they see. And one of the best compliments I got uh, maybe just a couple of weeks ago, somebody called me and they made the comment, oh, your house is just immaculate. Well, I walk through my house and I say, that's out of place. That's out of place. Everything has to be just so-so. And I don't know if <laughs> that's a manifestation of who I am internally. Yeah, well, it's, yeah that's, I think everything you're saying <laughs> is technically a manifestation of who you are, right? I think it all comes out of you. Um, but yeah. But yeah. it wears me out. It makes me tired sometimes. <laughs> uh, I, what I've been able to do this week a few times is to sit outside in the swing. And I had to consciously make myself not pick up a book, not do anything 
just think. And it freed me up. I, um, it, it was liberating. And uh, I think you need those moments because then it, you have more energy to pursue thing, other things that's important. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and I know for me, and, and you, this would have been covered, I think, in Chris's video, too. For me, a lot of my ideas, they come from those times when I'm not doing anything else. And uh, like with Chris, it's me was mowing his lawn. Right. And he says, <laughs> yeah. he always, when, when he said that, I thought, huh, he must want some more grass to mow. <laughs> <laughs> Augusta is a long way to travel to mow a lawn. <laughs> Um, and I said, for me, it was the drive, right? Uh, yeah. And, uh, so yeah, I think, I think there's a real viability in it. And, and I think that also connects to why you never thought of yourself as a creative person, because you are constantly in motion. You are That's constantly right. in motion and you are taking and processing existing ideas and coming up with ways to adapt them to your needs. And, and because you, you were never had a strong sense of that, of that, uh, that moment when the muse steps in, right. As it's been called yeah. in literature, um, <clears throat> that it didn't feel like you were creating, but you were, it's just that the muse was, was having to slip in a whisper here and there as you were, as you were, <laughs> as you were shooting by doing the next thing. Right. <laughs> but I, I don't think, I don't think there's, I don't really think there's any real big difference in what we think of as creative or art artistic endeavors and, and adaptation. Right. I mean, I think that I think they're one in the same drive. I think the, one of the very first creative acts that humankind ever did was was some caveman somewhere was trying to move a boulder. And he realized, you know, if I knock the corners off this thing, it would roll better. And all of a sudden he had a wheel and he said, hmm, that was easy. What if I put a stick to it, put another one on it? Huh? You know, and it was just this idea. Like that, and he was adapting and creating. And he, didn't, he never thought of himself as an artist, you know. <laughs> he he really had to rethink it once he ran over himself. <laughs> yeah, and he got his toe. You know, and they that invention probably happened a few times, and the first few said, "I'm never trying that again." You know, but somebody said, "Wait a minute, wait a minute." Yeah, uh, yeah. One of the instances I happen to remember is when we lived in Louisiana. Oh, I would say in the mid 1980s, the old house we lived in did not have enough cabinet space to mm -hmm. hold groceries to hold pots and pans, to hold anything. And I had to get creative there. Uh, what used to be the pantry to the old kitchen was so small and the adjoining, on the other side of the adjoining wall was the bathroom. Which, which is also no, too small. With, yeah, so uh, when your dad knocked that wall out and put a new floor in, it all became the bathroom. And so I still, that lessened the space that I had. So the door going into the pantry was just nailed shut. So uh, my idea was to have a piece of pegboard cut to fit in that opening. And I got the little metal brackets to go in the pegboard and that's where I put my pots and pans. And then I bought some one by four boards and had them cut specifically specific lengths to go behind the other door on the opposite side of the kitchen with a little lip on it to hold my canned goods. And I just put a curtain in front of it and nobody knew, you know, that it was storage, but it was just using what you had and the space you had and making it work. Yeah. Uh, but now that I've looked back and see the pictures of that kitchen, even though that's been a long time ago, it still looks good. Uh, I think possibly because the colors I chose, I like white, everything was white. And then we had the green marble floor and it just, it looked, it popped. And so uh, part of my creativity, I think, is learning colors, what looks good. And mm -hmm. I have maybe three or four books on my shelves and that's all it is. It's about color. And uh, mm. I'll pull those off my shelf a lot of times if I'm trying to figure out what I want to wear. Well, what's another color I can wear that with this that would be compatible? And uh, my wardrobe is very basic. Uh, I don't buy 
I can't use a lot of flashy clothes with a lot of details that are easily remembered. And I, that's where I use my scarves and things to change things up. So that's yeah, so I can have, you know, just basic skirts, basic tops, and depending on the size of the scarf that I wear, I can change this outfit up, and I can have the same base on, but with a different scarf, a different shape, different whatever, and I can make three or four or five outfits out of that one. You're right. And that, so I, I have fun doing that. But I love color, and uh, it's learning what looks good where and on who and the shape. You know, I've studied shape a lot. <laughs> yeah, that, yeah. So you spent some time perfecting, perfecting that, um, and you, and which is the kind of thing that artists do, right? They spend a lot yeah. of time studying principles, studying fundamental, studying craft, um, um, which is to say. They spent a lot of time learning how to use old tools and old concepts, which means even yeah. people we would call our artists don't do anything totally original. The only original, the only truly original act in an artist's toolbox, I think, is is how they recombine things. Okay, okay. that's it. I think that's I, I, totally it. Um, even the people, even even musicians well, I like in the that moment. Definition better. Yeah, yeah. Well, it. I mentioned this when I was talking to John in in our video. Um, which is not published yet. It'll be up soon. Um, it, it's kind of a gold. It's kind of one of those golden principles that that the African American community had to had to embrace because of being stripped of all their culture when they were forced over here. That yeah. they had to settle for recombining, you know, fragments of whatever was left over that they could remember and things they were they were gleaning from the white culture around them, and they weren't even the good fragments. I mean, they were given the refuse of of culture and you know, snippets of books that they, pages that they could find and, and food, you know, food items that were considered the throwaway or stuff that you would feed the livestock, you know, I mean, grits and, and turnip greens. And, and uh, so what were they doing? They were forced to, to make do. And what came out of that experience was the most defining, only truly, truly, purely American part of culture, because it's, it's everything else was borrowed from Europe. But that yeah. is the first true, and it came out of recombining, you know, odd, odds and ends and tidbits that they had in leftovers, right? And since then, let's face it, some of the best American cooking, it, come, it came straight from an African-American uh, kitchen. Exactly right. Some of the best music, I mean, even country and Western that we think of as a very white form of music, there are things they're doing in that music that if there had no, been no blues and been no jazz and been no spirituals, country music wouldn't be up today. So we're all stuck recombining, um, and that's that's just the way art works. And uh, that's and your survival. You know, a lot of our lives. Uh, you know, there are times whenever well, we were kids, and uh, you and Dad, it was tough. You know, work was scarce, or there was other reasons, and we were having to make do, and do with what we had. And that's and that's we didn't know it, but we were being turned into create creative beings, or our creativity was being enhanced and brought out because I think it's in everybody. But yeah, I think one of the pluses is we did not have a TV in the house. Mm -hmm. And so in order to occupy your time and your mind, you you automatically became creative or uh, it, I just can't think of dying sitting on the shelf. You know, that's what you're doing if you're not out doing something. Doing, doing. Yeah. The key part of creating is doing. Yeah. And there are so many things that we do as pastimes today um, that are very passive and mm -hmm. they're not doing, and therefore you're not building any skills. You're not seeing op opportunities and ways things could happen and connect because you're never putting yourself in position to see those things. Um, you're just, you're just gleaning from someone else who was creative, um, while missing out on, on a side of yourself that I think gives a lot of satisfaction and joy. And frankly, right now with COVID-19, it's one way that I keep, you know, myself, my spirits up and, and boy, does it work. I mean, I think this last weekend I can feel kind of the the seclusion and the sense of, you know, isolation kind of trying to set in a little bit. Mm -hmm. But uh, I started working on a project and doing something and I worked myself right out of it. And I'm just 
I, I, I can't hardly sit still right now. I've got so much energy, uh, not right now, but, but anyway, I mean, I'm just, it's, it's just awesome. I'm really enjoying life, even though I'm kind of wondering and fearful about what yeah. might happen next. I'm still enjoying this moment. Well, that, uh, what you, uh, just expressed the excitement of your new project, mm -hmm. uh, Two weeks ago, I was at odds with myself thinking, okay, what can I do now? What am I going to do? I'm bored. I am i don't really want to do this other. I don't want to do that. And then when Cole came to the house to do his homework, uh, he Cole would be Cole would be the youngest of your grandchildren. That's uh, right. My nephew. All right. That's right. Anyway, he was complaining with his neck hurting. And I said, well, Cole, I said, would you like to know the name of that muscle that is causing you some pain? So I pulled down my books on muscles from back when I had taken some kinesiology and I showed it to him. But I got re-excited all over again, looking at these muscles, thinking, okay, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to relearn all of this. <laughs> and uh, it has, um, I'm seeing something in it that I didn't see 10 years ago. Um, just looking at the muscles of the hand and uh, the muscle between the elbow and the hand on the ulna. And uh, there, that particular one nerve that goes into those thirteen or nine muscles, uh, it, it was just fascinating. And I'm thinking that one nerve controls what those nine muscles do, and yep. it, I, I, it's about how things fit together. And so, yep. you know, I, I just, I. Th Things like that intrigue me. Yeah. Uh, That's something else about creative people. Like I said, I think all people are creative. They some have it suppressed because life has just made them either suppress it or undervalue it. But um, when you give way to that, uh, your curiosity starts taking you interesting places. And, and you know, who knows how, how your study of, of anatomy in that way is, is going to trickle down and somehow influence some creative expression in yourself. Um, but that's what you do. You input, you input stuff and later it comes out in interesting ways that you don't expect. And that's another, that's kind of another exciting thing about projects and, and doing things like that. You're, as long as you're inputting quality stuff and spending some time with it, then that just becomes a, another tool in your toolbox. Let's ask, uh, I want to talk about some of your specific stuff that you actually, um, are working on and have worked on. And we see in the background, some, some mannequins. Um, and by the way, these mannequins, while you yourself, I don't think cut them out of wood, you're the one who came up with these shapes and found these silhouettes somewhere and, and had these mannequins made as a way to show off your, your, your wares, um, speaking of in the scarves and we see some, some things back there. So talk about what we're seeing behind it. Behind well, it. is it okay if I just move out of the way and y'all can look at those? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. As long as you tell us what's going on. Okay. I was needing uh, some mannequins or some kind of a stand to display the scarves that I make. And so I contacted a friend and I told him what I wanted and <clears throat> I offered to pay him for it. And uh, he said, well, no, I don't want you to pay me for this. He said, if you'll just uh, do some work for me, some hem some pants for me. I said, oh, great. I said, that's, I like the bartering idea. So the first mannequin is a drape. Can you see this? Yes, we can. Okay. It drapes around the shoulders. It has our, uh, holes in the side so you can insert your arms. I've made uh, several of these. I like to work with the lightweight sheer fabrics especially on my serger, that particular uh, thing to do is not easily done by anybody. That took hours and hours and hours of practice to figure out how to feed this type of fabric into mm. a serger and get the rolled hem edges on it without the edge coming off of the fabric. Mm. Uh, this has a couple of small seams in it. 
this is just a large rectangular flat scarf that I've drawn around the body and tied a knot here at the neckline. Okay. This one here is an extra long, probably, I'm guessing, maybe 72 inches. So it's draped around the neck also, crossed around to the back, and then knotted on the side here. So any fabric that, is, like I said, I like color. So if I see something, um, I'll just buy it, and I enjoy doing the rolled hem edges on sheer fabrics. They're lightweight. They're feminine. Uh, they give versatility to the wardrobe. Um, and I have, because I enjoy making them, I have more than I can wear. Uh, in the past, I have sold a lot. I have given a lot away because I don't have the space to keep them. But that doesn't keep me from making them. <laughs> it, it, it's, just a, it's just a fun thing to do. <clears throat> well, I was real, huh? I was going, but if you're not finished, go ahead. I was going to say, uh, you've talked about the scarves, but we also have uh, something to accessorize the hair on the one mannequin, too. <laughs> Years ago, when you were probably about um, four, three, four, five years old, the fad with the group of people I went to church with, we had all this long hair that we had to deal with. But they didn't wear hats so much, but they would put these great big flowers in their hair. And uh, anything that's a fad, you know, you kind of go along with it. And I enjoyed it. But then after a while, you get older and you think, no, that that's too young for me. I won't do that anymore. And you have all this stuff. Uh, here about three years ago, I had gone to Louisiana. And there are still quite a few ladies in the South that wear hats. And I was never really comfortable wearing hats because I felt like it drew too much attention to me. But my dear sweet brother-in-law said, well, you need to wear a hat. You need to wear a hat. So I bought one, brought it back home with me, and I, I decided I was going to wear hats. So that particular summer, that year, I acquired several hats. Let's see, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I have probably about 15 hats now, different colors, but uh, they needed some uh, umph, you know? So I started decorating them. Uh, this particular hat right here, was just plain black and I put some black flowers. Hold it up hold it up a little bit higher, Mom. Okay. Oh yeah. See yeah. Uh-huh. Can you tell the difference between the flower and the hat? Can yes, absolutely. So uh a lot of this stuff, you can get flowers cheap enough anywhere, but feathers are hard to find. Uh they're a little bit pricey. You can find them at Joanne Fabrics, uh, sometimes at Michaels craft stores, things like that. But I made several of those uh, this year. I haven't had a chance to wear my hats uh, because everybody's quarantined. But uh, I don't know. I have quite a collection. I, I wanted to get basic colors again because I want to be able to wear them with several different outfits. Right. But uh, to me, that's bottom line. Classy not overly, you know, uh, ostentatious. Is that a good word? Yeah, yeah. I, uh, I just do it for the fun of it. But what makes it even more fun is when somebody says, oh, that's beautiful. I just love mm -hmm. that. I love that. And the, then the most disappointing part of it is I'm thinking, well, you know, if you like it, why aren't you wearing a hat or why aren't you wearing a scarf or what do you want one, you know? And I did, uh, a friend of mine, I gave a kind of, it was a small fascinator that I had ordered. I gave it to her and I, 
I guess she feels the same way I do. She thinks maybe she's drawing too much attention to herself. So, but she's only worn it once. Yeah. But, you know, you know, um, some, when you're creative, you, you, there's always a sense of, you know, really, I mean, I, I, it's not that I've never created things um, with the intention of just, of just doing the, doing it and not sharing it. I mean, I'm, I can't say that I've never done that, but what I can say, even though I have done it, I've done it with the intention of investigating something that I might try later and then share it. Right. Um, there's always a sense of audience. Right. And I, I think <laughs> you, you, you're going to have an audience. Audience is more of a musical you know, turn, but it's, it's true of readers and literature and it's yeah. true of sewing. It's every, everything. Art, art and creativity. We, we love sharing it and we love putting it out there and having people, you know, enjoy it. Um, and you're right. There's, there's, there is some satisfaction in them saying, Oh, that is beautiful. Yeah. Um, but there's even more satisfaction when you see them using it, wearing it, uh, yeah. doing it, 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 using it later. Right. With me, I love to, I love it whenever I hear someone say, oh, man, I was just listening to your concert again on YouTube. You know, what I'm thinking yeah. that's cool. Right. Um, yeah. So but I, but I think there's a flip side to what you were saying is because you're willing to put yourself into that and then put it out there. Uh huh. That's gutsy. Right. Oh, that's is you, it? That's you making yourself vulnerable, right? You're putting yourself uh -huh. and your work out there for people to critique and either like or dislike, disapprove or approve of, and find useful or not. And and there's there's some bravery and courage in doing that because you pour yourself into that. When you put out those scarves and your work, in some way, this is a part of Shannon being put yeah. out there. And same's yeah. true about my my poetry or my my songwriting, right? It's it's a it's like a part a representation of my thought process and what I do, and I'm putting it out there, and um, and so that's a gutsy move. Well, whenever what you're giving away <laughs> is 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 a little more flamboyant than people are used to, and it's something they're supposed to wear, they don't necessarily have that that confidence or that that courage that you do, and that you've had to overcome. I mean, you mentioned. You see, you didn't because you couldn't do it because you did felt, but, and, and boy, doesn't that tie in with a lot of, a lot of uh, traditional norms about never putting yourself forward, right? Uh, the problem is, is when you are a creator and you're making stuff for, pub, for the public consumption, that is a good way to, ha to, to handicap your efforts um, by saying, I'm not going to promote myself. Well, you better, if your work's going to get out there and people are going to see it, who, I mean, who else is going to promote your work, you know? You can't keep <laughs> slipping it in places and hope people like it and notice it. No. Um, but yeah, but you're right. They are not. They I will haven't. tell you, let me tell you this. There Go have ahead. been several instances in my past, in my creative ventures that it was laughed at. It was made yeah. fun of. Wow. And then I didn't say anything, but then after the fact, the very ones that would laugh at it, make fun of it, would come back to me and they would want me to do for them what I had done before that they had laughed at. Right, right. And I'm thinking, don't you remember? You know, and I'm thinking, oh, just get past that. Just get past that. Yeah. But I never thought of myself as being bold or gutsy or any of that. I just, it's more fun to worry too much about that. Oh yeah, yeah, and to some degree, you know, there there is an aspect of whenever you're creating and making, uh, you get you in the early stages of the thing, you have to protect it. You got to right. you got to protect it and only share it with certain people that you know will be you honest yet supportive, right? Uh -huh. um, so you you can't just put it out for public consumption anywhere, and after it's even done. Even whenever it's it's valuable, when you do put it out there and whoever gets to see it sees it, um, I, that's still the risk. But you got to really. I, I have found that I, until it reaches that stage, I have to protect it from uh, and only sh share it with certain people because if they don't have the sense of willingness and open mindedness to look at things different ways and be supportive, then they can kill that process and just take the take the wind right out of my sails. Right. That's and, right. I mean, once it's done, I've got confidence and and. And if I can get some positive feedback and people that like it, um, it's okay if some of those unimaginative, poor, insecure people want to tear it down because I know <laughs> where they're coming from too, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs>
<laughs> I think sometimes they wish they would have been the ones to have thought of it or done it or whatever. Uh, I, I would like to credit my dad for the ingenuity part of me. He was always one wanting to create, wanting to find a way to do something. Mm -hmm. And um, I find myself to be more appreciative now mm -hmm. than I, what I was when I was younger. Uh, yeah. I, I just cannot imagine not having that ability. Right. Right. I, I just, it seems like a dull life. Yeah, you, you're right. You're right. I'm with you on that. Now, you've talked a lot about um, the hats. You've mentioned, you know, the scarves and the silhouettes. And you've even mentioned how you have, by the way, I want to say personally that I, you know, having been to your house and even helped with some of the projects around there, um, that so the same sense of composition, of of making it visually pleasing that that really expresses itself in your in your house as well um but i remember one of the earliest creative ventures i remember well before we do that one i think one of the very first things you ever did creatively that you did on a consistent basis and it, and even to the point of you actually kind of developed an audience who appreciated it and that was uh hair <laughs> yeah uh, the beginnings of that was when I was probably about nine, eight, nine years old. Uh, my dad had a sister. We called her Aunt Pat. Mm -hmm. She was of the same bent. She was very focused, very driven. She owned her own beauty shop. She was very good and very fast at what she did. Uh, she had probably 85 to 90% of all of the customers in the little town that she lived in. Hmm. Uh, she put in hours, long hours. And to top it all off, she was really very pretty. Now, I would not say that she had the most appealing personality of all, <laughs> but... Uh, it didn't matter where she lived. She moved from that spot in her early years, her marriage to Texas, then to California. But wherever she went, she owned her own beauty shop. She was never employed by anybody else. And because I thought she was so pretty and because I wanted to look like her, I wanted to have beautiful hair like her, I would stand in front of the mirror for hours and when I say hours I mean hours um, starting at age 11 I think it was I would come home from school and instead of doing homework I was standing in front of the mirror for two to three hours at a time trying to get my hair to look just so so this curl had to be here that curl had to be there it had to be even it had to be this and i was going through a can of hairspray a week and well, the <laughs> morning would roll around and your grandmother would want me to comb her hair for her and she would get so angry because we had no hairspray i had used it all <laughs> but uh Combing hair is just another median. You learn to work with it. You learn to, you just know what you can do, what you can't do, where to put the pin, where to put the curl. It's just working. And a few years ago, I had decided, I thought, well, I'm going to take some art classes. And after the first class, we had an assignment you know, draw this picture. What I learned from that one class that I went to was it's not the technique that you know. It's just making up your mind. You're going to sit down and you're going to learn it and you're going to spend time with it. Yeah. If it's really what you want to do. You're going to spend time with it until you get it to the point where you think you know enough. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, but uh, I like 
I thought when I was a kid I wanted to be an artist. I never pursued it, but I did the hair because I thought, you know, I didn't have fifteen, twenty dollars every week. This is fifty years ago to spend to go have my hair done. So I had to learn to do it myself. It was the same way with the sewing. I didn't have the money to go and buy the high dollar outfit suit formal that I needed. Uh, I had your granny to do my clothes for me and then I had to learn on my own. Uh, so it's more of a necessity of what I thought was important, what was important to me. Mm -hmm. now, those things were not necessarily important to a lot of other people, but the, uh, what I notice in these other people is because they, it wasn't important to them. You can tell now by looking at them, it's not important to them. So <laughs> I'm just, I'm thinking about, you know, it's whatever you're willing to spend time with, That's whatever right. makes you feel good. Yeah. I've, I've told piano students and students of other things that were, you know, learning some sort of, skill or something it's a thing i say all the time there's no replacement for time spent there's, there's no. no shortcut no replacement um now the other thing that i really remember from when i was a kid that that where you express some creativity and and it's it kind of fell in my mind it was kind of falling prey to that whole notion if it's not entirely original then it's not considered creative or not considered art and and it just so happened that I had, I mentioned that in another video. I don't remember if it was the one with Chris. I think it was the one with John. Um, and then you almost said word for word that same notion about yourself. So I was like, oh, okay, maybe I see where I had that idea from. That it has to be totally original to be art. And so for me, I never, I, at first when I was a kid, because I believed that, I didn't see the appeal of your ceramic shop that you had because <laughs> all those molds are existing designs and things that are somebody else thought up. And you're just copying the things they had done. So at first, I didn't get it. Yeah. So talk about that. Uh, I saw pieces that I really liked. Uh, back then, it was uh, cheaper to go and buy a piece of greenware, clean it, have it fired, paint it, have it fired again and have these nice pieces sitting in your home. Uh, another thing, I, it was a great opportunity to be able to create and make something to give away as gifts, especially birthdays, Christmas time, mm -hmm. things like that. And always, like you said, we come from a background where there was no money, there was nothing. And so you were always looking for ways to make something work, right. to make something nice to give to people because you want to reciprocate or you want to be able to give somebody something nice. Mm -hmm. uh, I That was always very important to me. Uh, I think one of the reasons why is uh, my mother always made me feel like it's very important that you give people something that you thought of, that you thought they might like, uh, that you put some thought into, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. And I would um, always, I think I spent more time trying to figure out what somebody else would like than I did putting it into the actual project. Um, I did end up owning my own shop we ha I had several hundred molds. I had two kilns and um, <clears throat> I think back on it, it was an excellent opportunity. And I, I don't think I really pursued it like I could have. Uh, there were too many other things I felt like I had to control that was getting my attention. Mm -hmm. and then we just moved away from it. Uh, but I do have a couple of pieces here that I made. Uh, can you see them? Yeah. <clears throat> These, this little chair up here. Pull it back oh. closer to your, closer to your face, Bob. So okay. There, yeah, okay. Okay. 
and then this one is sits on the edge of a shelf and then this other little one right here kind of laying on his belly I made these two pieces years and years ago for your granny and gave them to her for Christmas so when she died last year that was some of the pieces that was sent back to me but hmm. I I did not uh, keep a whole lot of things for myself I have a couple of dolls, three dolls that I made. Um, but I gave most everything I made away. And if I made anything um, in duplicate or a number of items, it was because somebody would call me and say, we need some gifts for kids for school. We need this, we need that. Uh, I have a little dresser box that I made that was also your granny's that I got back. And I have another, I love, I liked boxes, any box, pretty box with a lid. I have a smaller one that I keep matches in, uh, just odds and ends. And I think anything you keep for yourself has to have meaning. Mm -hmm. Just to have a bunch of stuff, it becomes clutter. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, uh, and it, I think it, uh, it uh, stifles your, um, your creativity if you just end up collecting a bunch of stuff because you had a good idea at one time and you made a whole lot. Uh, one thing that comes to mind is us, uh, maybe five, six, seven years ago, I made maybe several pockets out of upholstery fabric for Bibles and things. And I didn't sell them all. And, but I ha didn't have the heart to throw them away. I didn't know what to do <laughs> with them. And uh, so here about a couple of months ago, three months ago, I th I needed, here's organization again. I was just throwing all of my belts in a drawer and I try to pull one out and then the whole drawer was a mess. I couldn't find anything. So I thought, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to get a curtain rod. I'm going to sew a loop on these pockets and suspend them from the curtain rod in the closet. And each pocket will have a belt in it. And it has really worked out well. Oh, wow. Repurposing <laughs> yeah, so, there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so it's just, uh, there'll come a time. I throw things away. I, I get rid of more now than I used to because my house is getting too full. So uh, are are the scarves on that same pathway? <laughs> I don't know yet. I have them stored <laughs> in boxes, <laughs> literally boxes. I have them stored. Uh, and I can't bring myself to get rid of them because there's too many people every once in a while say, Oh, I like that. I'd like to have one. I'd like, and I'm thinking, well, I just got rid of it, you know? Um, yeah. I By was, the way, let me just weigh in right here. Anybody in YouTube land, if you want a various sizes and shapes of scarves to accessorize your outfit with, there's someone in Augusta who has a large variety. <laughs> <laughs> let me ask you about, let me ask you about um, a kind of a totally different uh, aspect of this. And we've talked about, um, I remember when you first started getting into sewing, you had sewing machine. And mm -hmm. then later, I had never even heard of a, such a thing as a serger. And yeah. uh, then you got this serger. And, and then I remember when you had your, you had your cutting table. And then that was a, my first introduction to a rotary cutting tool, which I have one of those now. It comes in handy for all kinds of projects, by the way. Um, so, so talk about how tools both both uh, enable you to do ideas you already had, and then once you have those new kinds and different tools, how that opens up other options and ideas and sparks other ideas that you didn't have before you got the tool. First of all, any tool that you have is going to make your job easier. 200 years ago, all sewing was done by hand, mm -hmm. maybe a little more than 200 years ago. But even the intricate work that they did uh, still fascinates me. I don't want to do it. It's too time consuming, <laughs> but uh, I have some pieces that 
were hand done, uh, I think are very valuable. But I, my first sewing machine, no, let's go back. The first time I sat down to a sewing machine, I was probably about 13 years old. And it was my mom's sewing machine. She had bought that when I was a baby, and she had made some of my baby clothes on this machine. I now have that machine in my house. I have learned since then that it is a prized machine. A lot of home sewers would like to have one that old around because it's all metal parts. It will sew heavier fabrics, thicker fabrics that your newer, more modern machines cannot handle. So I, uh, I use that occasionally, but there were no fancy stitches on it. It was just a forward stitch and a back stitch. Hmm. Uh, then the more modern they become, the more stitches that they had, which appeals to a lot of people if they don't do a lot of sewing. Uh, oh, I can do this, I can do that, I can, and they don't, until they get into the sewing part of it, even on your newer modern machines with the fancier stitches, it takes a little bit more time than just running a straight stitch on a piece of fabric. But hmm. after I learned the basics of sewing, how to put a pattern, cut the piece of fabric and put it together actually all that is bottom basic is uh if you can put a puzzle together work a puzzle then you can put a pattern together uh it's like cloth puzzle pieces if you match all the dots and the notches and follow the directions then you'll have a piece of clothing but uh when i saw uh, the work that could be done with a serger, or some people call them overcast machines, I became fascinated with this little, tiny, tiny, narrow, rolled hem stitch. And it's very, it's no wider than maybe a sixteenth of an inch, and it's right on the very edge of the fabric. But I loved that stitch. And I wanted to do that stitch. And uh, even though it's more complicated to thread a serger, if you want something, you're going to learn how to thread that serger. <laughs> if you want that stitch on the edge of a fabric and you want a certain type of fabric, you're going to learn how to do it. And uh, I... The cutting table was just another accessory that I felt like I really needed because it would speed up the process. If you have the right kind of tools, the process is a lot simpler. Mm -hmm. But your granny didn't have a cutting table. She would lay all of her stuff out on her kitchen table in the kitchen, and she used her bread and butter knives as weights on the pattern pieces and she used her little electric scissors and she was so good and so fast she could wear out a pair of scissors in two or three weeks and because they didn't last her that long because she did a lot of sewing uh, she was constantly getting them replaced free because they had a, a warranty on them but mm. uh, she uh, she was my inspiration, and I think one of the greatest compliments I ever got on my sewing was from her. And I had made a doll for her, and I made the little outfit, the gown that went on the doll. And she said, Shannon, that is some of the most beautiful work I have ever seen. And I was shocked because I thought, that doesn't compare with what you used to do. And so I think a lot of times... Um, I, I've never, what I'm trying to say, I've never reached a point where I f felt like I measured up to somebody else's standard. Mm -hmm. I'm constantly striving to do better. Yeah, yeah. Um, which brings me to, by the way, just for the audience's uh, clarification, you've, you've heard, heard my mom refer to her mother, and you've heard her refer to a person called my granny, and basically granny would be my dad's mom, so it would be... It'd be your mother-in-law. 
um, <clears throat> who was qu known as quite the seamstress uh, in her day. I mean, she had clients and customers coming in and out of that house there in Marywood subdivision all the time. And she, she had, had over a hundred customers at one time. Yeah. I mean, she was always so, and her house was always immaculate too. Yeah. So she was a, she was a worker. She was a doer. And, yep. and that's, and because she was a person who was used to making do, um, she did. And yeah. Yeah. So you said you never felt like you measure up, um, which is another thing that can, make us feel like we're not creative. Um, there is, there is a, I, I forget who it was. I may be wrong, but I'm wanting to say it was J.D. Salinger and the novel was Catcher in the Rye. I'm thinking that was the book and I may be wrong, right? Maybe wrong author, maybe the wrong book. Um, but that guy, he had like a, a dozen or two dozen drafts that that novel had gone through and he still was not satisfied with it. And the only reason that book got published was a friend snuck the manuscript out of his house and, and got it to a publisher and got it published. Right. So he was never feeling like it was good enough, good enough. And, and I've always kept that story because, and maybe I shouldn't, because I, I think I tend to be the opposite extreme. I tend to be so happy and excited about a work that I'm rushing it into an audience um, before it's really polished as much as it should be. Uh, but I think for someone like you, that story would be more useful because your house is an indication. If you walk in your house, it's an indication that the level of and quality of the work you do is an indication that you really are very driven to try to perfect the piece that you're putting out. Um, so how do you know when to stop polishing? <laughs> uh, with what I'm creating, if it be an alteration on a formal, if it be a particular shape of a garment or a scarf, and I just see one little thread. It's not quite right. It's not quite the point that I want, the square that I want, the curve, whatever. I'm, I look at it and I ask myself, would they sell this in a store? The hmm. person I'm doing this for, would they know the difference? Yeah, yeah. I have to ask myself that question because I could spend a lot of time on the perfection just to give it or put it out there. And after the first few times of wearing it, the little detail I was worried about is not near as noticeable as the wear and tear they put the garment through. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, my house. Uh, you're I'm, the audience. You're, you're the main audience member in that particular work. <laughs> if I have a piece of furniture that I cannot find a place for, that does not fit, it doesn't look right, and I've moved it around four or five times, I get so irritated and frustrated with that piece. I won't keep it. It, it goes out of my house because I can't stand the distraction of it not being perfect. Yeah, it, it, it violates your sense of composition. Yeah, that's right. I can't yeah. handle it. Yep, yep, yep. Yeah. yeah, that's a good, that's a good, uh, and I, I, I said that I'm the type of person who tries to rush things into production too soon, but I can't say that's true about all my stuff. Like, I'm very hyper aware of when I mess up when a piece of music or it's not, I don't quite hit the note like I want it to. Um, and I had learned being in star city syndicate that, you know, it's never going to be perfect with that many people playing. Um, there are times when I would say, man, I wish we could practice that more. I wish we could have done some sectionals so that we could get the particular parts better. Uh, but I, then I have to tell myself, man, does the community, is the community really getting something out of this? We're getting something out of it. What, what a camaraderie we've got going on. And there's a joy in that moment that even if we didn't quite pull off like we wanted to, it's definitely valuable. It's bringing people together. And uh, so it's a good thing to remember that perfection is it's shoot for it for a little while. But the moment <laughs> you get kind of close, call it good. You know, that's right. <laughs> because your spirit, the striving, 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 
the irritability, the unhappiness mm -hmm. w with the whole situation can start bleeding over into the project itself. And, and shut you down. It can it shut can. you down. Yeah, and then yeah. the joy's gone. And the joy's gone, why do it, right? That's right. That's right. Well, Mom, um, I don't know if you, you're not aware of it, I'm sure, because your back's been turned. But Susie Q, it looks like the bow has has moved down <laughs> to the bottom of the pigtail. Okay. And, uh, and I think I think what what's happening is that uh, that that could mean that our time is almost up. <laughs> the oh, bow, okay. the bow is about bored. to drop. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have thoroughly enjoyed this. I, I'm so glad to get to talk to you. Uh, the other interviews I've done, they've been with uh, musicians, and of course, Chris is a, a writer and another person's a, a teacher. And the and uh, so I'm glad that we can show that creativity. Uh, your your particular um, versions of creativity to show that it manifests in all kinds of different ways. Um, and yeah, I, I just think it's been great. And this has been a wonderful addition. By the way, I hope you don't mind, but whenever I label this video, it's going to be called uh, Making It North Episode Whatever. And I put the guest name after that. Well, for yours, I'm going to put Scott. So just so you know that. You're going to put what? <laughs> Mama Scott. Oh, okay. <laughs> Okay. Great. All Great. right. I love you and, and uh, have a wonderful day and I will talk to you again soon. Love you too. Bye. Bye-bye.